Turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 22. And just leave your marker there for a moment. I titled today's teaching, Don't Be Lazy. Don't Be Lazy. Studies show that Americans are becoming more and more lazy. But as Christians, we don't have an option. We are called to reflect our Creator. As creatures created in the image of God, we are to reflect God. And one way in which we reflect God is we have to have good work ethics. When we possess good work ethics, we make God look like what He is, a hard-working God. And so God, again, made us like Him. We share some of His characteristics. That's what it means to be made in the image of God. And our God is a hard-working God. We do not serve a lazy God. We serve, again, a hard-working God, a God who is literally working all the time. There's never a moment in which our God is not doing something. While you and I snooze, God is working. While you and I are taking a break, God is working. God is always working. Let me tell you why God is always working. One, because it's who He is. And two, because the moment He stops, stuff falls apart. He consistently cares and watches over all of creation. The moment He stops working, we stop working. God overlooks superintends and cares for all of his creation, all of his creatures. Think about that for a moment. Our God keeps over 8 billion people alive and trillions and trillions of animals and creatures. He even keeps the angels alive. He even keeps demons alive. He is a source of all life. God is always working. So to be lazy is to misrepresent the hardworking God who made us. To be lazy then is a sin. Now, I'm sure we're all guilty of being lazy from time to time. It happens. But this is something that we need to get out of. Why? Because this is something that God doesn't like. This is something that misrepresents his character. Now let us read there in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 13. Proverbs 22 and verse 13. The lazy man says, There is a lion outside. I shall be slain in the streets. <laughs> this verse is repeated in Proverbs 26 and verse 13. The writer in Proverbs is basically saying that lazy people exaggerate and that they will make up any lame excuse on why they should stay home and not go to work. Like, there's a line outside. So no clocking in today, no clocking in tomorrow. According to this verse, laziness leads to craziness. Mm. Making up all kinds of lame excuses on why the lazy man will not work. This verse reminds me of the parable of the talents or the wicked and lazy servant found in Matthew 25. Three servants are given an amount of silver. That's what the word talent means, an amount, by their Lord. One was given five talents, the other two talents, and the last one was given one talent. And the first two doubled the money given to them, but the last guy buried the money he was supposed to multiply through hard work. He went as far as to accuse his Lord of being too hard and being too cruel, which means he doesn't know the Lord at all. The Lord comes and he says, what did you do with the one talent that I gave you? And he tells him, I buried it because I knew how hard you are. You know how hard I am? He was accusing God of being cruel. Just like the lazy man who said, there is a lion outside. The man in this parable said, you are a cruel Lord. It's a lie. It was just an outrageous excuse to be lazy. Long story short, the truth about this last servant 
was as Matthew 25 and verse 26 says, but the Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. In this parable, this wicked and lazy servant was cast into hell. And this points to the fruitless and unproductive false convert. So it really does point to a false convert, but laziness is frowned upon here either way. And God has entrusted all of us with something to do for Him, something to do for His glory. And He expects us to be good stewards with the things that God has entrusted us with. Can I get an amen? Now, no true believer will ever be cast into hell. The point here is the one that did not produce was the one that wasn't a true servant of God. And his wickedness and his laziness, spiritually speaking, and his misunderstanding of God's good character proved that he was a, an unbeliever still. But still, we are called to be hard-working Christians, hard-working sons and daughters of God. I read an article titled, Five Lazy Excuses. These were obviously five excuses that lazy people make to stay put and not go to work or to not get ahead in life. Number one, lazy people say, I'm waiting to be motivated. I'm waiting to be motivated. The question I ask is, what if that motivation never comes? <laughs> waiting for nothing. Number two, I'm just not good at this. Number three, I am not as creative as him or her. Number four, I'm content. Now, as you know, contentment is good, but it's not good when it's said only to not work harder. So contentment is good, but it's not good when we just don't want to do anything else and we're happy in our lazy spot. Number five, lazy people say it's too late for me. It's too late for me. And so they find any excuse that they can to not get ahead, to not do more work, to not be productive. Just like that crazy guy in Proverbs 22 and verse 13, where he says, there's a lion outside. I may be slain in the streets. That's how the lazy man speaks. I read another article on the nine behaviors of a lazy person. This is what a lazy person is like. Number one, procrastination is their middle name. So they wait until the very last minute for everything. Why? Because they're lazy. Number two, they're always tired. You talk to a lazy guy and that lazy guy or gal is just always tired. Number three, they avoid responsibility. This reminds me of the lazy servant found in Matthew chapter 26, right? He was given one talent, he avoided his responsibility, and he buried the money because he was wicked and he was lazy. And number four, they have a messy environment. They have a messy environment. So there's clutter around them. Where they're at is dirty. Uh, there's no organization. They don't take care of the things that they have. Number five, they're masters of excuses. Number six, they lack passion. They lack passion. Number seven, they're indifferent to growth. They can care less if they see no growth. Number eight, they choose the easy way out. Number nine, they lack initiative. In other words, lazy people will not volunteer. They will not volunteer. They will not be the one to step up first and say, count me in. And if we're honest, I think that we're all guilty of one or two of these lazy behaviors from time to time. Can I get an amen or an ouch? But again, today's message is titled, Don't Be Lazy. That's the whole point of Solomon writing Proverbs 22 and verse 13, speaking of the lazy man. Don't be like the lazy man. Be productive. Be hardworking. Reflect your God. King Solomon, who is the writer of Proverbs 22 and verse 13, was no stranger to hard work. King Solomon was a very hard-working man. He was known for his hard work. He was known for his creativity and the breathtaking work 
that he did and his many accomplishments. For example, as you know, King Solomon was the one who built the very first temple of God. And it was lavishly done. He also built a lavish home for himself, which took 13 years to build and finish. And it wasn't because he ran out of material. It was because he was that creative. He was that detailed. He was an artist. And everything that he had built for himself had to be done with absolute excellence. And so he superintended everything that happened. Why? Because he was a hard-working king. We find there in 1 Kings chapter 6 and chapter 7 these two things. Him building the temple, him building a home for himself, and many other things. Solomon had a golden eye for art. For beauty, for design, for architecture, for construction. And just to get a small taste of Solomon's exceptional work ethic, let's read 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 29 to 34. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 29 to 34. And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart, like the sand of the seashore. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all men. Then Ethan, the Ezrahite, and Heman, and Chalcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahol, And his fame was in all the surrounding nations. Now listen up. He spoke 3,000 proverbs. And his songs were 1,005. Also he spoke of trees from the cedar tree of Lebanon, even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish. And of men of all nations, from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Think about that. Solomon spoke and no doubt wrote, as we read many of those Proverbs here, 3,000 Proverbs. These are 3,000 wise sayings and compose 1,005 songs on top of managing a kingdom, on top of having a thousand women. That alone is crazy. And as you guys know, that was a bad thing. Now, I by no means am comparing myself to Solomon here. The comparison would be Mount Everest right next to an ant hill. But I couldn't help but think that by the grace of God, I've written about 100 songs and have constructed a couple thousand sermons. Solomon was a man of intense study and research. Through his hard mental work, he attained a wealth of knowledge about all things. That's why it says there in verse 31, says that he was wiser than all men. And one could say, of course, he was wise because God made it so. God made him wise. That's true. That is very true. But this doesn't mean that Solomon didn't have to use his God-given mind, wisdom and understanding in rigorous ways to learn what he learned. He put in the demanding work. Solomon was the antithesis of laziness. Solomon was the opposite of laziness. Solomon was always working. Yes, God gave him the mind. But that mind didn't work all by itself. He had to do some research. He had to examine things. He had to think hard. He had to put words together and sentences together. He had to study humans and animals. He had to be able to know who God is and what life is all about while constructing massive and magnificent homes. He's writing songs and, again, tending to the needs of his people, which were millions of Israelites. This man was always working. And so when he speaks of laziness, again, he knows what he's talking about. 
He's the opposite of that. Being a hardworking and productive human being, again, is just one of the many ways in which we are created in the image of God. It's just one out of many ways in which we are created in the image of God. Again, like I said in the beginning, we do not serve a lazy God. And, and you know, as I was reading about how America is becoming more lazy, I think it has to do with all the entertainment we have. I think it has to do with all the social media we have at our fingertips, at our disposal. I think it's all the fine foods and fast food restaurants that we can go to and, and all of the material things that are readily available to us, you know. And because of all of these things are always before us, we can become lazy and unproductive in ministry, in our hearts, in our homes, in our marriages, with our children. Why? Because we're getting caught up with the things of the world. And sometimes we don't have a good handle on it. Sometimes we are not as balanced as we ought to be. Again, we don't serve a lazy God. When we are lazy, we misrepresent Him. So when we're being lazy, it's like we're saying, our God, who created us in His image, is also lazy. And He's not lazy. When we are hardworking, we reflect on His hardworking character. Regarding God's hardworking ways, turn your Bibles to Isaiah 45. We're going to read verses 11 and 12. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and His Maker, ask me of things to come concerning my sons, and concerning the work of my hands. You command me. I have made the earth and created man on it. I, my hands, stretched out the heavens and all their host I have commanded. I mean, God is basically saying, look, I'm a hardworking God. He says the work of my hands. I have created the countless galaxies in the universe. There are literally trillions of galaxies in the universe. Ours is the Milky Way. That's just one and it's tiny in comparison to many of those galaxies out there. And in those galaxies are trillions of stars. And most of those stars are bigger than Earth. And God has created all that. Not to mention, again, all of the animals, all of the insects, all of the things that we can't even see with the naked eye. God has created all things. He's a hard-working God. And Psalm 139 tells us that when a baby is born, it is God's hand knitting that baby together like he's sewing something together. God is always working. God is always creating. And if we are going to reflect Him well, we have to find ourselves walking in His footsteps. Now, of course, there is a danger in becoming a workaholic in the sense that we don't rest enough or we can become unbalanced and begin to neglect the most important things in life. But when I say having good work ethics and being productive, I mean so in every sphere of life. Not just where you punch in and punch out five days a week or more. All right, every sphere of life. We are called and created to possess good and productive work ethics. Whether it's keeping the home, keeping a family, keeping a business, keeping a church, or keeping a nation. Of all peoples, Christians should be known for having an excellent spirit and excellent work ethics to the glory of God. When I think of an excellent spirit, I think of the prophet Daniel. He was known as one who had an excellent spirit. And I'm sure he had excellent work ethics as well. He was without reproach. We should be the most reliable and the most trustworthy workers. Your employer should look at you and say, Oh, I am so glad I have you as one of my employees. You are the best or one of the best that I have. Why? Because you're reflecting your God. The same God these unbelievers don't know. They too are made by Him. They too have traces of His image. But they don't know Him like we do. And because we know Him, we ought to reflect Him. And our bosses should be very happy. We should be the most reliable, the most trustworthy, the most 
truthful, the most faithful. We see God's hardworking image in us when He created Adam, the first man, uh, the first human being. God created Adam to be a laborer before He made him to be a lover. He was a laborer before he was a lover. God made Adam a hard worker before he made him a husband. Genesis 2 and verse 15, I'll read it to you. It says this, Then the Lord God took the man, that is Adam, and put him in the garden of Eden. For what reason? To sit there and eat berries and cherries and grapes all day long? No. It says to tend and keep it. In other words, God created the man and then he put him in the workforce and his job was to work hard in tending the garden and overlooking the needs of the animals. And so God created a hard-working man. And this should always be the sequence. This should always be the pattern. A man must be a hard worker before he gets into a marriage relationship. A man must be a hard worker before he gets into a marriage relationship. That's the pattern we see with Adam and Eve. If 2 Thessalonians 3.10 says, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. I would also say, If any man will not work, neither shall he marry. And think about how strict God is with that. He says, you don't work, you don't eat. You want to be lazy, you, you don't eat. You want to be lazy? You shouldn't be in a relationship. It is said that one of the top characteristics a woman looks for in a marriage material man is his work ethics, which I think is great. Uh, The woman should say, does he have a job? Can he keep the job? Can he hold the job down? Can he provide? And the reason why this is one of the top characteristics a woman looks for is because a woman needs to feel secure and a lazy man can't provide that sense of security. And the man doesn't have to be rich. The girls are probably thinking, but it would be nice. <clears throat> but he should be a hardworking man. Let's read Proverbs 24, verse 30 to 34. I went by the field of the lazy man and by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding. So we can equate laziness with a lack of understanding. And there it was, all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. When I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. So shall your poverty come like a prowler and your need like an armed man. And so there you have it. The writer of Proverbs here says he was taking a walk and he paid attention to a vineyard that was no longer being tended to. Why? Because the person who was responsible for that vineyard and the beauty of it and the produce of it was lazy. He was a lazy man without knowledge and he loved sleep and slumber more than he loved to work and to tend the things that God has entrusted him with. Of course it's easier just to lay back and sit back but I'll tell you one thing those weeds are going to grow They're going to take over those grapevines if you don't tend your vineyard. In this case, the sluggard lets his vineyard go to waste. Others may let their family go to waste. They look at the situation their family's in, but they're too lazy to do anything about it. And so they'll just sit on that lazy boy and change the channels or sit down and swipe up and down all day long. Others may let their marriage go to waste. They look at their marriage, but they don't want to make the necessary changes. They don't want to make the necessary improvements to keep that vineyard looking beautiful and healthy. Others may let their ministry go to waste. God has entrusted them with responsibilities, but because they're too lazy and too disinterested, they will not put their heart and hands to the work. 
And very little to no produce comes of that. God does not bless laziness. God does not bless laziness. Some may let their children go to waste. Others may let their physical house go to waste. We're called to work hard. We are stewards of all that we have. We just manage what we have. Everything we have belongs to God. Laziness is closely connected to carelessness, to apathy, which leads to ruin. Which leads to ruin. And this is wisdom, folks. When you see things fall apart, just remember this experience that the writer of Proverbs 24 had when he walked by a vineyard that was no longer being kept up. Just remember, something here is not being kept up. Anytime I have to counsel a marriage or a family or a person, I keep that in my mind. If I see things falling apart, it's because something in this relationship is not being kept up. Someone's not plucking out the weeds, you know. Someone's not watering this thing. Someone's not making sure that this gets enough sunlight for things to blossom and flourish and become fruitful. And so it leads to ruin. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 20. We're going to read verses 33 to 35. Paul the Apostle was a hardworking man, and that's what we're going to look at. He was a hardworking spiritual leader. He was a role model to pastors and leaders and ministry workers of all kinds in every sphere of life. He was an altogether great example. Acts chapter 20, we're going to go ahead and read from verses 33 to 35. The context here is Paul the Apostle is speaking to the elders, the pastors there in Ephesus, and he has some last words to say to them before he makes his way out of Ephesus. Verse 33, he says, I have coveted no one's silver, gold, or apparel. In other words, I did not strongly desire or lust after anyone's money or material things. Verse 34, yes, you know yourselves that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. And so we can see here that a leader cares for his own and he cares for others. And that should be the mark of every true believer. In America, you're encouraged to be a consumer. Everything you do is for yourself. What you have, how you look, how you dress, what you own, what you eat, where you go, where you go to vacation, what car you drive, what house you live in. It's all about me, the American. But according to scripture, we are to work and use our money to bless not only the needs of our family and ourselves, but to reach out even further than that and meet the needs of others. Verse 35, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this. He was a tent maker and a preacher, obviously, that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And there are other passages that say, you ought to work in order to give. Not just in order to pay your bills, so that way you can have the latest phone and the coolest shoes, which is okay, but the whole point is we don't just live for ourselves. We live for the church. We live for the body of Christ. We live for the need of our next door neighbor in our neighborhood. You look around, you see if you can meet any needs. If you have extra money, do it as the Lord leads you. And so we work to be a blessing to others. But the lazy man, the lazy man does nothing good for himself, does nothing good for the church, does nothing good for others. Why? Because he is lazy. He is self-focused. She is self-focused. We want to stay away from that. We got our God as an example. We got King Solomon as an example. And we got the Apostle Paul as an example. They all teach us something. Turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 23 to 25. And then we'll conclude. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 to 25. We're going to go ahead and read verse 22. Bond servants, we can say employees, obey in all things your masters. In our case, we can say employers, according to the flesh, 
not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. Stop there. As you're working very hard for your boss, for the company you're working for, we're not there to please men. We're not there so that way people can praise us necessarily. We want to be a blessing to the company, but we're not there for accolades. You know, there are some people that work harder and even better when the boss's eyes are close by. But when that boss's eyes are somewhere else, they start lacking in their work. They start eating up minutes and some people even hours. It's called pilfering. That's stealing little by little. And so we don't do that. Why? Because we know that God is watching. The ultimate boss of the universe has his eyes on us. Lord, help us. 23, and whatever you do, do it heartily. That means do it with all of your heart. Whatever you do, what is it that you do? Think of all the things that you do. And I hope they're good things, by the way. <laughs> it says to do those things heartily. To do those things with all of your heart. To put your energy into it. To put your passion into it. And to do it with all your heart. He says here, as to the Lord and not to men. Why does he say, as to the Lord and not to men? I'll tell you why. Because if you work like this, as unto men, the day's going to come when your boss is a jerk. And you become a jerk at work too. Why? Because you're working for him and not for God. But no matter how the circumstances at work, they're paying you less, they're cutting your hours, the boss is a jerk. You remember, God is in charge of my hours. God is in charge of my pay. God is above my boss. And I will still work heartily. With all my might, heart, and strength. Why? Because I serve the Lord. Because ultimately, He's my master. Ultimately, He's my employer. And so He goes on to say here, Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, the Lord is saying, I'm going to reward you for the way you worked. I'm going to repay you. When they cut your hours and you still worked as unto me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you in heaven for those hours they cut. Do you understand that the Lord is going to bless us for how we serve Him? Whether it's at home, whether it's in our marriage, whether it's in ministry, no matter what it is that we do, if we do it as unto the Lord, the Lord will reward us. He is ready to reward us. And so we know this. Okay, my workplace doesn't seem to be rewarding me or acknowledging me in any way. And I'm probably one of the best workers here. God knows it. God sees it. And the day will come when he will bring it up and he will bless you. So don't complain. Just work. Don't complain about how much you make or don't make. Don't complain about how bad your boss is. Pray for him. Just work. Work as unto the Lord. Work as unto the Lord, and you'll have a happier heart and attitude while you're there. Everyone else is going to say, wow, we're all complaining over here, and you have a smile on your face. Why? Because I work for God. I work for God. And He promises me in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, that if I put Him first, He's going to meet all of my needs. He says in verse 25, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. In other words, God repays the wrong that we do as well. Why? Because He's a just God. He's going to reward you for the good. He's going to repay you also for the bad. In one way or another, God corrects His children. Let us bow our heads.